This is Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Follow on Twitter. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. Spread it like this. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. We Marking Out, y'all. We Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. Welcome to Marking Out. Pro Wrestling Talk by Pro Wrestling Fans. This is episode 720. Make sure you check out MarkingOut.com. Check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and also Amazon Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating to go with that five-star frog splash. Give us a like on Facebook. Give us a follow on Instagram at MarkingOut11. On TikTok at MarkingOut. And also on Twitter at MarkingOut. You can follow me, Dave the Rave, on social media platforms at DavidPTDPT. Chris on Instagram at Chris uh, CMSweeney85. And on Twitter, Chris Sweendog. And you can follow Brandon at BTTG161. And I am here with Brandon. Brandon, how are you? I'm doing awesome as always. How about yourself? Fantastic, I tell you. Just just absolutely fantastic, I tell you. Yeah, how was your week? It was fantastic, I tell you. How was yours? Mine was decent. Didn't really do much. I made a Philly cheesesteak-inspired pasta dish. That I don't think I would, it, it was okay, but I don't think I would make it again. Mm-hmm. Why not? I, I, I feel like when I eat something like that, I just want, I want bread. Mm-hmm. Not pasta. So, but how was your, your big trip? It was good. It was good. It was great. Uh, I actually went down to Washington, D.C. Got to go see uh, the White House. So went to the White House, which is pretty cool. Uh, they have a, like, it's all enclosed because they're building a stage for the inaugural uh, celebration. So at they the have Capitol. a stage. Huh? That's at the Capitol. No, no, at the White House. No, that's at the Capitol. I'm telling you, at the White House, they have it blocked off. I don't know what that off. stage is for, but the stage that they do for the inauguration is at the Capitol. <laughs> well, the sign that's on the... On the fences in front of the White House say that it's for the inauguration. Maybe it's like a Secret Service post or something? Uh, or for no. cameras, maybe? It says, it says, please excuse the disruption. The District of Columbia, in coordination with the National Park Service, is constructing the 2025 Presidential Inaugural Parade Reviewing Stand. Yeah, reviewing stand. That's got to be something that's not, that's not like where he gets sworn in or anything Mm -hmm. that's always the capital yeah well that's what they're doing there it was really cool um i was actually i did a loop and then i ended up i was walking back to see everything and it was just really cool because i saw people standing around and they had police bear like just police station and i thought that maybe they were just stationed because it's the white house and stuff like that but then I heard people like being like, oh, my goodness. And I'm like, what's happening? And I look and I notice that the motorcade is actually pulling out of the White House. And apparently it was Biden uh, pulling out of the White House to go to Air, Air Force One. And I looked it up really briefly after that because I wanted to confirm. I asked some one of the police officers if that was the president. They, they confirmed it. Um, but... I didn't really know, but then I looked online How and it said that. How could a police officer confirm that? I feel like that's not something they should be able to do. Yeah, um, but then I looked online and it said that Biden was just leaving the White House to go to the Air Force One with his granddaughter to go to Peru for the uh, conference that there wow. was taking place down there. So that was pretty cool. Uh, after that, I went to the APT. I went to APTA headquarters uh, for the next few days for the um, for. The program that I was a part of, the APTA Leadership Scholar Program, uh, APTA Association Leadership Scholar Program, which was a, an incredible experience that I'm very grateful for. I got to work alongside many incredible 
leaders and I got to have the experience of learning from a lot of mentors um, such as former APTA presidents and vice presidents and acad people in academia, which was just an awesome experience. Um, yeah, I didn't really explore Virginia too much because of work uh, and everything like that, but it was really cool. It was really nice. The Smithsonian. I did not. I did not. Or I walked any by of it. The, anything in DC is free. Yeah, I walked by them. I didn't. I didn't know about my timing because I had to be back in Virginia at two p.m., which means I had to check into my hotel. I had to get dressed and everything like that. So it just was going to be too much of a Michigas. Mm. So, but it was awesome. How was uh? Well, you said how already your went week through was. that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so preparing let's for get Thanksgiving through. for next week. That's all. Yeah, Thanksgiving's upcoming. Gobble gobble. Um, going to New Jersey to be with family. How about yourself? I'm going to my aunt and uncle's house. I don't know. I'm I'm gonna be disappointed if there's not like good Thanksgiving food. I don't think I'm going to be cooking, but I need to hear what they're doing first before saying 100% I'm not going to be cooking anything. Mm -hmm. Because I'll be really pissed off if there's not good stuffing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe I'll just make it regardless because stuffing is fantastic, and that's something I'd like to do. I don't like yeah. making it, but I I like eating it. That's, that's what I should say. So I like eating it more it's than crazy it. this is a i don't know in how many years but i saw cbs isn't airing the parade this year why i don't know i guess they decided not to maybe it was too big of a hassle or something obviously mm -hmm. the the main people that always air it is nbc regardless but but cbs mm -hmm. always put on i thought a, a decent parade gimmick they had their own people and so yeah, they usually do really cool things. Uh, I don't know. I used to. I I remember when they had the WWF float at one point, which was cool. I think WWE had uh, float maybe t either twice or three times. I think once was like the WWF era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember one with like British Bulldog and stuff, but I don't really remember much of it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's a that's yeah about Monday it. Night Raw yeah Monday, Monday Night, Night Raw, Raw kicking off. off with Judgment Day, which uh, Liv Morgan said that she knows Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair were at Monday Night Raw, so they didn't come alone. That brought out Nia Jax, Tiffany Stratton, Candice LeRae. The Big Three came out and they're like, "Well, we didn't come alone." And then EO came out and Liv was like, "You're still outnumbered." And then Rhea Ripley returned, face mask and all, and she said, "War games, they all brawled." So yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that Rhea Ripley Ripley is back because I wasn't sure how long she was going to be out for. It's just disappointing because I, Bailey is like, I, I understand everything that's that's gone on with with Eo Bailey and Bianca Belair. But I feel like Bailey would still be that perfect fit for that team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just hope that I I just feel like some of these wrestlers are falling through the cracks at times. So, well, after that we saw Rey Mysterio and Zelina Vega pick up the victory over Chad Gable and Ivy Nile. I liked when American Made both stomped Rey Mysterio down from from behind the referee's back. I like that. And then later on, Chad Gable tried to prevent Zelina Vega from a hot tag. She ends up rocking him with an enziguri. And Rey Mysterio took over the match. But Chad Gable had a little comeback. Rey took over again. And he catapulted Zelina Vega into Chad Gable for a top rope park in Rana. And I thought that was a cool spot. I always enjoy when we see... Instead of mixed tag action, we see intergender like that, even though it's not official. Mm -hmm. So I like that. And then Rey Mysterio hit the 619 and the springboard splash to pick up the victory there. Kind of predictable, though. Yeah, 100%. And then afterwards, Chad Gable like 
he pushed around, slapped, I think, Julius. And he was just hyping up the creeds like, we're better than this. So mm-hmm. we had that backstage. Gunther was there. And he told Ludwig Kaiser, go make a name for yourself. Don't speak for me. And he brought up Ludwig Kaiser's father and told him to stand for his own man. And Gunther saw Damian Priest. I guess he had those thoughts of what Damian Priest said last week. And he went to attack Damian Priest. Priest ends up knocking him down. Adam Pierce shows up. He's like, oh, I forget exactly the, the one line that, that, Damian Pier- that Damian Priest said to Adam Pierce. But I thought that was good. It's like, oh, we were just talking or something like that. Because clearly you, you weren't. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. Kind of far from it. After that, you saw Braun Breaker versus Sheamus. This was for the Intercontinental Championship, but it ended in a no contest. Hard-hitting match. And they had a very, lot of near falls. Very hard hitting match. I didn't think Sheamus was going to pick, was going to have a clean victory. Um, but w- what do you think about the no contest aspect with him and Braun? Well, I mean, I, I get it, I guess. You have Ludwig Kaiser interrupt and make a name for himself. So it makes sense, but I was enjoying the match. Sheamus went for that bro kick. Braun Breaker ends up rocking him with a spear. Sheamus rolled out of the ring. And when Braun Breaker went for that drive-by spear that he does on the outside of the ring, that's when Ludwig Kaiser showed up. And he attacked Braun Breaker, and then he attacked, he hit that drive-by drop kick to Sheamus into the steel steps. Mm -hmm. Surely that's going to be a triple threat or something like that. I could see it becoming a triple threat, and it should be. Um, I kind of think Breaker is going to win, though. I would assume that Braun Breaker walks out as champion as well. I wouldn't be. No, I don't. I wouldn't be okay because Braun Breaker just won the title back. Mm-hmm. So it sucks that Sheamus is always in the Intercontinental Championship scene. At the wrong time, almost. Because I still do want to see Sheamus win that Intercontinental Championship. I agree with you. And why it he's going for... Grand Slam. Yeah, the Grand Slam. I would totally be fine with that. I think that would be really special. But again, it always seems to be the wrong time. What do you mean? Well... I mean, when he, when Gunther was champion, you can't take it off Gunther like that. Now Braun Breaker is champion again. Oh. You can't take it off Braun Breaker. Yeah. After that, we saw the War Raiders pick up the victory over the Judgment Day. The team of Dominic and Carlito, I believe, for the first time. Um, I'm glad that the War Raiders got a, a win over a team like the Judgment Day. Mm-hmm. And also, it's not surprising that Carlito was the one to eat the pin here. But J.D. McDonough and Finn Balor attacked Ivar afterwards. Eric tried to make the save. They shut him down as well. They have to be the next tag team champions. It has to be the War Raiders. I don't know when it's going to be. but I agree. I really want it to be the War Raiders. I think that they deserve that. And I want to see a massive run from them too. Yeah, and a lot of people are complaining about the, the fact that Judgment Day only, I think they have one televised title defense since they won the titles. I understand them being completely upset with that, but I also feel like it's the MO of the Judgment Day to weasel out of defending the titles. Yeah, I mean, it's heel. They are heels. Why would they understand when people are complaining and saying there's no reason why WWE should have two separate tag team champions for the brands or whatever. Well, that I do. I don't like so many championships. I don't know. I'm I'm super torn on that. The Mm -hmm. women, I understand because there aren't tag teams. The men, there are tag teams. There are so many tag teams. Mm -hmm. So for that, I get it, but not, I don't, I wouldn't want that for the, the women to have two separate titles. 
I I like one. I don't know. Although I, I like less say, titles. I will say the NXT Tag Team Women's Championships being unified with the Women's Tag Team Championships. That still kind of irks me because there are so many women down in NXT as well. Mm-hmm. But I think they've done a decent job at like sort of integrating NXT here and there with this title. Mm-hmm. So when the War Raiders become the tag team champions, I can't tell you, but hopefully they do have that that incredible run like you were saying. Yeah, they deserve it. And I think that we need a strong, powerful tag team like this. And we need a dominant tag team run with lots of defenses. I agree. Next up in the main event, you had Bronson Reed pick up the victory over Seth Rollins. Um, I almost got really annoyed because I, I thought that Seth Rollins was going to win. Well, earlier in the night before this match even took place, the OG Bloodline spoke to Seth Rollins to try to convince him to join their war games team. And Sami Zayn said that Seth Rollins had bad blood with all of them. He had bad blood with Cody Rhodes and all of that was forgiven. And Seth Rollins was like, he reiterated, I will never stand side by side with Roman Reigns. Nor should he. And the bloodline came out. The OG bloodline came out to brawl with them to the and back. I'm just, and I'm that I don't want do I don't want to see Rollins align himself with Reigns at all. I mean, this is a conversation we had last week where I was going to say I'm torn about it. I'm I, super super torn about it. I was going to say I'm pretty positive we spoke about it last week, and I still maintain it. I do not want to see them tag at all. We're like it makes one half no of sense. Me, yeah, one half of me like completely understands it. The other part of me is just like the I shield. Need- I'm a mark, the shield. <laughs> it, don't be such a mark. There, There's too much of it. The thing is, it's. I feel like if you skip and you have them align with each other as a tag team, I feel like there's an entire chapter or chapters missing in between then. Yeah. Those two moments to kind of build it up. I feel like there's too much in between uh, their WrestleMania moment and then them teaming up again to reunite as the shield. I feel like there's just too many chapters in between that I that really need to be written. Like the current AEW champion losing his championship and returning to WWE. <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know if I'd ever see the three of them teaming up again. but I know. But who knows? I think I, I would see it. I could see Ambrose returning. I don't know. I, don't, I really, I don't know. I can't see that. I really can't. The landscape has changed so much that I don't think they need Dean Ambrose, but I would be, I'd be there for it. We were there mm. for the Shield's first match. Yeah. So, but as far as them teaming up at this point, like it almost, it almost makes sense that it would have been Seth Rollins because Bronson Reed stepped up to join the bloodline team but in the same sense maybe it it will be cm punk maybe it's cm punk that steps up and i mean he's a paul Heyman guy as well Mm -hmm. and i think the last person that on tv that spoke to paul Heyman was was cm punk i think i don't know bring back curtis axel and then solo I didn't even remember last week on SmackDown when Roman Reigns called Paul Heyman and the 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 phone was like doo 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 sorry your your call can't be completed. I didn't remember that Solo Sokoa smashed Paul Heyman's phone. So I have to assume that was a callback to that huh. as to why and and even more so that means that Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns have not spoken actually since WrestleMania storyline wise. Mhm. I'm here for that and and CM Punk that was there was something with Paul Heyman and CM Punk so we'll see maybe they'll say something on SmackDown and all of this will be for nothing. Yeah. But this match I thought it was a hard hitting match on Monday Night Raw. Seth Rollins went to hit a curb stomp from the top rope and Solo Sokoa showed up, distracted Seth Rollins and Bronson Reed took took over. 
he crushed Seth Rollins with that tsunami and eventually won the match. Yeah, I was really happy to see that happen because, like I said, I really thought that Seth Rollins was going to pick up that victory. But once that interference happened, I was just like, oh, thank goodness. I think we need to see a tsunami off the War Games cage. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that would be sick. Moving over to NXT, it opened up with Nathan Fraser picking up the victory over Eddie Thorpe to qualify for the Iron Survivor Challenge. All the tag teams came out during this to watch, and they inched closer as the match went on, and they ended up brawling with everyone, just like how NXT closed last week. Yeah, they all watched, a.k.a. tried to get involved. Yeah, Nathan Fraser at one point jumped out onto a bunch of them. It led to Eddie Thorpe having a slight advantage, but I was very surprised. Nathan Fraser came back to win that match. And then later on, Fraser was talking to to Axiom, (laughs) and Axiom told him that he also has a qualifier match next week against Ethan Page. And... He was, like, annoyed at first, but then played it off that he was happy for Axiom to have that match. I don't think Axiom is is also qualifying for the Iron Survivor. Mm-hmm. I think, obviously, Ethan Page has to be the person to get into that match. Yeah. So, that'll just cause more tension between the tag team champions. I, I agree, and I feel like that's what we do need is that tension to build and build and at some point it's going to explode and it's not going to be it's going to be like okay there we go but who steps up as the next tag team champions beer money hmm. no <laughs> i don't know no i mean i could definitely say i don't think it'll be beer money uh that is a safe bet i that think is unfortunately a safe bet. that ship has sailed mm. unfortunate after Next that, up, you had Stephanie Ficare pick up the victory over Jada Parker to qualify for the Iron Survivor Challenge. Uh, there was no way Ficare was not going to qualify. Yeah, in this one, I don't think so. Um, and I thought this was a good match. I think I enjoyed this more because there, there wasn't all that chaos from the outside. Mm-hmm. But Lola Vice appeared, which distracted Jada Parker, and it led to the end of that. So, two matches in a row. Annoying. True. Yeah. After that, you had Tony D'Angelo pick up the victory over Brooks Jensen. For what it was, I thought it was a good match. It was kind of short. I liked when Brooks Jensen was in control. But I didn't think, and I don't think he should have walked out victorious and he didn't Mm -hmm. you had sean spears out there i don't feel like that caused any like distractions no i think he was just he was just more there but afterwards sean spears shook tony d'angelo's hand brooks jensen chopped tony's like what was a bad knee Mm -hmm. and then tony d'angelo went to ava afterwards and wanted a match he he's basically I guess they goaded him into giving a championship match to Sean Spears. And Ava was like, if you can get cleared, I'll give you, I'll, I'll make that match for next week. At the same time backstage, Eddie Thorpe was pissed off that there was outside interference that cost him a shot at the Iron Survivor Challenge. And she said she can't do anything about that. I feel like she can do something about that, but I guess not. I mean, (laughs) like she's the one who directed those tag teams to like step up and make a name for themselves, basically. Yeah, and they all distracted. They all got involved in that match. Mm Hmm. I feel like there's something she could have done. I think she know she could pull a few strings to get it to happen. After that, we saw Carmen Petrovich and Ashanti the Adonis pick up the victory over Brindley Reese and Dion Lennox. At the start of the match, Carmen Petrovich and Ashanti the Adonis kept tagging in and out because they both wanted to start. 
so they couldn't get on the same page. But Carmen Petrovich finally got in the match, almost loses right away. But they continue the match. Adonis ends up distracting Brindley Reese. And she slaps him, but when she turned back around, she got kicked, and that was the end of that match. Yeah. And then later on, I think it was, uh, Carmen was talking to Ashanti, and uh, another woman showed up and was like, I'm waiting for you to call me. And she's like, I knew it, and like walked off, I guess. So there's still trouble there. I don't know when that's, if there's going to be like a full turn for Carmen Petrovich, if she's going to. End up dating Ashanti the Adonis on TV? I, I have no idea. I feel like they're going to end up together. It seems feel, like they have to at this point, but I, I that I feel like also means a heel version of Carmen Petrovich. Yeah, I feel like we definitely have to have that take place. Carmen but, Petrovich, by the way, is facing Sumi Sakai at uh, Bloodsport this weekend. I think that was pretty cool. Oh, I think the only thing that would make that match cooler is if Natty was the referee, given her history with both of them. But mm-hmm. that's pretty I don't cool. Think that's happening. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Next up, you had uh, Zaria pick a victory over Ren Sinclair to qualify for the Iron Survivor Challenge. This was the match that, unlike Stephanie Vicor's match, I could have seen Zaria losing, but due to outside interference, and I'm glad that didn't happen because I would have been annoyed if there was more outside interference like that. Mm -hmm. There were definitely moments where Ren Sinclair looked like she could have had a huge upset over Zarya. But in the end, she ate a spear and then got hit with that F5 to lose that match. It was a nice F5 too. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that F5. I'm looking forward to that being in... Probably a DLC move for 2K25. Yeah, I liked it. After that, you had Fatal Influence come out. Fallon Henley issued an open challenge for next week. Metaphor showed up. Fatal Influence went face-to-face with them. And then Nikita Lyons showed up to, I guess, stop them in their tracks. And also tell Lash Legend that she's had her chance. Now it's my turn. Adriana Rizzo showed up to attack Nikita Lyons. More women showed up, and they all brawled, much like the tag teams have done. And Fallon Henley just watched it all happen. And then from behind, Tatum Paxley showed up, hit Fallon Henley with her finisher, and that match gets set up for next week. I don't think Tatum Paxley will be walking out as the North American champion, but I'm looking forward to seeing that match. Mm-hmm. Yeah, next I think match, it's going to be a good one. Next match is heartbreaking. Very heartbreaking. Mm. You had Ridge Holland pick up the victory over Andre Chase to become the number one contender. And that's not all that came out of this. Chase U is no more. Chase U is dis. Banded, they are kicked off of the campus. But as we have seen in many, many movies from the 80s already, it may not, or also old school, it may not be the end of Chase U over time. I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know where they go from this. Mm -hmm. The match I thought was very good, though. I like you had. Almost, I think, towards the beginning, Ridge Holland pulled up the mat ringside. Andre Chase fought him off, and I believe he ended up affecting, or not affecting, he ended up not using it to his advantage, I think, later on. But Mm -hmm. Ridge Holland low-blowed Andre Chase behind the referee's back. Thea Hale, at the very last second, pulls the referee out of the ring. She obviously doesn't want Chase U to end. Duke Hudson ends up going through that platform in the crowd. Riley Osborne dove to the outside. He knocks down Ridge Holland, but also takes out Thea Hale. That was very surprising. Yeah, I didn't expect her to get taken out like that. And then Ridge Holland pressed Riley over the top ropes onto that exposed floor. The crowd was going nuts for Andre Chase's uh, comeback. But eventually, Ridge Holland caught him with that DDT. He won the match. 
And some of those sick freaking fans were chanting the na na hey hey goodbye. Yeah, they were not a fan. In what in what world? <laughs> in what world are they sitting there in in the performance center singing that? Are they sick? This was like the and also the crowd reaction shots. Some of them were like were actual workers, but it's funny because the only thing I can compare it to is is Undertaker losing his streak. What? Not the like obviously not as big, but the crowd reaction to it was as if they just watched the Undertaker lose his streak. All right, I could kind really, of. It was a hundred percent like that. There were a bunch of marks in the crowd. But obvi- I mean, yes, but also there were workers. Like the there was one. I I don't know her name. She's a she's a uh, a student at the performance center. She was like crying. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a good reaction to show. But where they go with Chase, you, I I just I can't even fathom what this what this will look like. mm Hmm. So, yeah. That's very shocking ending to NXT moving over to SmackDown. It opened up with the Bloodline and Solo Sokoa spoke about War Games and said they're ready for it, but Roman Reigns isn't. Roman's not even there and when Roman gets there, he needs to meet him in the ring and accept terms of surrendering. He needs for the OG bloodline to acknowledge him. I'll put a pin in that. Chelsea Green picked up the victory over Bianca Belair and Blair Davenport to advance in that tournament for the United States Championship. I liked the stomp from Blair Davenport when she tied Bianca Belair's hair in the ropes with her ponytail. At first, I was like, why is the referee not counting? And then I realized I remembered it's a triple threat, so that has no effect I also liked when Blair Davenport got her knees up and Chelsea ended up drop kicking Bianca Belair and hit a sent on on Blair Davenport at the same time that double German suplex from Bianca Belair was nice but backstage they showed Jade Cargill taken out on the hood of a car and Bianca Belair left the match for that Chelsea Green almost lost the match. She ended up hitting the unpretty her and picked up the victory. So I'm happy that she won. Hopefully Chelsea Green is the, I'm very torn between Chelsea Green and Bailey. I I would really like to see Chelsea Green win that United States championship though. People seem to think that it was either Bianca Belair to take Jade Cargill out or Charlotte Flair. And I don't really see how it would be Bianca, but I guess anything's possible. Nick Aldis asked Nia Jax. Nia Jax denied it. We had LA Knight pick up the victory over Santos Escobar to retain the U.S. championship. A video from Shinsuke Nakamura aired before the match. And it was basically saying that LA Knight is insecure. And this is the beginning of his end. And during that video, Santos Escobar attacked LA Knight. And I would say he controlled a good majority of the beginning of the match. But Shinsuke Nakamura ends up showing up later in the match, temporarily distracting LA Knight. LA Knight ends up countering the Phantom Driver with the BFT to pick up the victory. So I thought that was a cool uh, reversal. And then Nakamura attacked LA Knight after the match. Very interested in this character of Shinsuke Nakamura because it's not something we've seen with him before. After that, Cody Rhodes came out. He called Kevin Owens out. He showed up in the crowd and Cody was like, I supposed to be in the ring, get to the ring. And Kevin Owens said no. And Cody went to go to him, but security stopped him. Cody goes back in the ring and Kevin Owens said that what happened to Randy Orton was Cody's fault. He reiterated that. And then he went to the commentary table and explained himself. He said for the last four years, he fought the bloodline and they tried to end his career. And he stood by Cody fighting the bloodline. And like, almost like nothing, Cody just agreed to stand with with Roman Reigns. 
And Cody said that him teaming with Roman Reigns had nothing to do with Kevin Owens. And it was the right thing to do. And Kevin Owens just has to be a victim. Cody Rhodes said that nobody holds KO down more than Kevin Owens. And he said that a fight will happen. Survivor Series, SmackDown, uh, Saturday night's main event. And Kevin Owens said that he'll get a match when he says he'll get a match. Cody was very fired up. Kevin Owens almost looked like he was holding back tears. I thought this was a great segment. And then backstage, Carmelo said something to Cody. They ended up pushing each other and yelling. You had Bailey and Naomi pick up the victory over Tiffany Stratton and Candice LeRae via disqualification. Tiffany Stratton and, and Candice LeRae argued at the start of the match. They eventually got on the same page for a while. I thought they were working well as a team, but Candace ended up tagging herself in. That angered Tiffany Stratton. Tiffany ends up tagging herself in at one point and had the upper hand. Bailey ended up throwing her to the outside of the ring, went for a tag spot to Naomi, and then Nia Jax attacked Naomi. They both also beat Bailey down. EO ran down, the Judgment Day showed up, they got the upper hand, and then Rhea Ripley came out with a kendo stick. The fans went nuts, and she hit some of them with the kendo stick, and they ran off. You had Montez Ford pick up the victory over Tommaso Ciampa. Earlier in the night, Johnny Gargano tried to get another title match against Motor City Machine Guns in front of uh, Taylor Swift, Billy Joel, Mick Jagger, a few other rock stars, but... Motor City Machine Gun said that because of how their match ended against the Street Profits, it has to be the Street Profits again. As for this match, I feel like a lot of it was during a commercial break. Champa ended up catching Montez Ford with a knee mid-air, and he went for that fairy tale ending, but Montez Ford reversed it. He pinned him. He held on to the pin and got that win. And then Tommaso Champa attacked Montez Ford afterwards. Angelo Dawkins got involved. Johnny Gargano tried to stop Dawkins. And Champa ends up attacking Dawkins from behind. And then Johnny Gargano pulled Tommaso Champa off and he, he questioned, what are you doing? Stop. And just like last week, Champa pushed Johnny Gargano down. And then Motor City Machine Guns came out. Champa got out of the ring. And he asked Johnny Gargano, whose team are you on? I, I can't see DIY splitting up. I have to believe that Johnny Gargano is finally going to agree with Tommaso Ciampa and perhaps turn heel. You had earlier in the night, the original bloodline in their locker room. Roman Reigns said that they don't need a fifth partner. They could win or die as the four of them, as long as it's the four of them. Fast forward to the end of the night, you had the Bloodline face off against the OG Bloodline. And Solo was like, we're not there to fight. And he said he still loves the four of them. And he just wants them to join his Bloodline so they could run the company for decades. And Solo said that they don't have a fifth member. They don't have a wise man. They have no choice but to surrender and join them. Or die. And then Paul Heyman returned in bloodline colors. I feel like that's not something we've ever seen from Paul Heyman, especially not a relaxed t-shirt the way he was not a t-shirt, whatever kind of shirt you would say it was. Perhaps I would say a t-shirt. I don't know. (laughs) But Paul Heyman said, you can't do a war games four on five. That doesn't add up to him. And it will be five on five. He brought out CM Punk. So forget what we spoke about earlier on Monday Night Raw. And CM Punk came into the ring. The 10 of them brawled. Roman Reigns and CM Punk stood tall at the end and stared at one another. And then Sami Zayn and the Usos got into the ring and they seemed happy about it. There's so much history between Roman Reigns and CM Punk. It should be a fun War Games match. And I'm looking forward to that. 
So that's SmackDown. Going to take a quick little break right now, and I'll be right back here on Marking Out. This is third generation superstar Lance on the White, and you're listening to Marking Out. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Marking Out episode 720. Going back to AW Rampage from last week, it kicked off with Hikaru Shida picking up the victory over Layla Gray. This is, we're back to AEW booking 101. Like I've been talking about. Like I just, I think I said last week. They have Hikaru Shida face a talent that is far below her on the card. And then they set up another match with Chris Statlander for Dynamite with obviously the outcome being... Hikaru Shida losing. It's copy and paste booking. And I think what's worse is that it took Hikaru Shida longer to beat Viva Van, who as far as I know is not signed to AEW, rather than someone who is signed to AEW. On Dynamite, you had Chris Statlander. What a surprise. Pick up the victory over Hikaru Shida. The match, kind of slow, but for what we got out of it, I enjoyed it. Chris Statlander kicked out of the Falcon Arrow. She ate a knee from Hikaru Shida. She reversed what I could only assume would have been another Falcon Arrow. And then reversed the Katana before hitting that, that Big Bang Theory to pick up the victory. Afterwards, you had Mercedes Monet and Camille come out. Mercedes said that she was impressed by Chris Statlander's win, but she's not going to lose the title. Then she sent Camille into the ring, who was in a sling, and she got dropped by Chris Statlander. She got dropped by Hikaru Shida. Mercedes went to attack Chris Statlander. She held on to the backstabber and turned it into a Big Bang Theory. The end of that. What they've done to Camille is is just like mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. She was a powerhouse, and I just I I can't get over what they did to Camille. I truly can't. After that, on Rampage, you had Mark Briscoe pick up the victory over Davari. This again is like it'll probably kill Tony Khan to have a member of the Premier Athletes pick up a victory. I would love to see the premier athletes picking up victories. The match was good. Storyline-wise, TV-wise, it just makes zero sense. You had Commander pick up the victory over Rocky Romero. This match, again, was like copy and paste. It's like the victim of Wrestler B needs to look like they can beat Wrestler A on another show. And then you fast forward to Collision. You had Shelton Benjamin pick up the victory over Commander. The match was dope. Shelton Benjamin was very aggressive in this match. I like that abdominal stretch that Commander did. But Shelton Benjamin, he picks up the victory with the power slam. After the match, MVP instructed Shelton to remove Commander's mask. And Alex Abrahantes jumped in to stop it, which MVP then took him out with a a clothesline. And the, the Hurt Business left. But that's, that's AEW booking 101 right there. Commander picks up a victory. Needs to look good to to make it look like he can win against Shelton Benjamin. And then lose this. We just said that with Hikaru Shida. Same thing. You had LFI pick up the victory over Alec Price and Richard Holiday. I thought it was kind of crazy to see Richard Holiday in a spot like this. I feel like he's more prominent than being an enhancement talent. So I don't know if this is going to lead anywhere. It would be nice to see him featured more on television. On Collision, you had the acclaimed pick up the victory over LFI to qualify for full gear. LFI has not had any meaningful wins at all. Not that the acclaimed have had any recently, but I wouldn't have expected LFI to go over. I wish both teams could have made it to the pay-per-view. But Max Caster used the rope that Roosh normally chokes people out with, and then he choked Roosh. Roosh sent him off the apron using that rope and it was around his neck. It was in his hands. The referee couldn't have cared less. It's it's we, we know what Roosh does with that rope. Should he not have taken that rope away? And then Roosh used it to whip Max with. I truly, I don't understand. These officials are awful. 
Outside of that, I thought the match was fine. In the main event, you had Ricochet pick up the victory over Dante Martin. This was a good match. I liked all the reversals that they did. They had some really nice ones. Um, There was some good high-flying action in this. I think as expected. I don't think Dante Martin should have had that much of a threat to Ricochet, though. Like, obviously, if you take the TV aspect out of it, I thought it was a very good match. Add everything into it with, uh, like, when Dante Martin has not been, uh, he hasn't accomplished anything in recent weeks. So, to have that length of a match against Ricochet in a main event, it just doesn't make sense to me, TV-wise. AEW Collision, you had Mina Shirakawa pick up the victory over Harley Cameron. One clip from this went viral pretty much as soon as it aired on Twitter. And I wish they would stop doing stuff like this because outside of that, I thought the match was actually really good. I don't think they need stuff like that for a match to be entertaining. And I think I would be more okay with a spot that that they did if it wasn't overused in backstage segments. I thought the ending of this match was really well done. Harley Cameron reversed the glamorous driver into a pin. Then Mina Shirakawa rocked Harley Cameron with that back fist and hit the driver to actually pick up that victory. I would just like to see less of the antics. I don't even want to talk about that stuff. You had Daniel Garcia pick up the victory over John Morrison. Jomo has... I guess, sort of been taken under the wings of Maximum Male Models. And they got involved in the match. Surprisingly, John Morrison controlled a majority of this match. But Jack Perry showed up and attacked Matt Menard, who was doing commentary. It didn't affect the match at all. Daniel Garcia didn't even see it happen. And you had Mansoor and Madden attack Daniel Garcia... Again, behind the referee's back. He takes them out. John Morrison misses the Starship pain. Daniel Garcia is able to come back from that. The match doesn't make me think Daniel Garcia can beat Jack Perry. That did absolutely nothing for him in this storyline. Afterwards, though, Tony Schiavone informed Daniel Garcia what happened to Matt Menard. And it cut to Jack Perry beating Matt Menard up, choking him with a chain backstage. Daniel Garcia showed up. He attacked Jack Perry. Matt Menard attacked Jack Perry. They chained him to a bus, to the scapegoat bus, and they went for a drive with him chained to the hood. That might be a first. I don't know if I've seen that in wrestling before. And then on Dynamite, they showed more of the footage where they had Jack Perry tied up. Daniel Garcia said that people in power see what's going on, but they just let it, they sit back and let it happen. And Jack Perry, it seems like he's almost like losing his mind, kind of. But Daniel Garcia smashed up the bus. And then they left and left him there tied up. It kind of reminds me of the Joker with how Jack Perry was portraying what he was doing, but I don't think he was good enough to pull off the Joker if that's what they were going for. And with him leaving Jack Perry there chained, there has to be some story of how did you get to Prudential Center? You had Powerhouse Hobbs back on Collision, pick up the victory over Bulk Bronson. The match was fine. The Iron Savages all got involved. Hobbs took all of them out. And he won with a torture rack, which I thought was impressive. But like I said the other week, Hobbs returned to be third fiddle in a storyline, and now he's nowhere. Even on Dynamite. I'll talk about that in a moment. You had Mariah May pick up the victory over Anna Jay in a no DQ match to retain the championship. Most of the times when AEW does matches like this, I think they absolutely deliver. This was no different. This was a very good match. 
Um, I like that gory special from Anna Jay onto the ladder. Mariah May hit a falling power bomb through a table as a reversal to a superplex. I thought that was good. A guardrail was eventually set up in the ring, and Anna Jay sup- superplexed Mariah May onto it. And then Anna Jay put a wrap of barbed wire around her own arm for the Queen Slayer. Mariah May ended up spraying her in the eyes. And then she hit the Storm Zero on a chair to pick up the victory. I was surprised they didn't do blood in this. I don't think it was necessary. I'm glad that they didn't do blood. Very, very well done match there. You had John Moxley after that cut a promo on Orange Cassidy. He called him a snake. And he said Orange Cassidy didn't go to the hospital when Chuck Taylor got hurt. He doesn't care that Wheeler Yuta has gone down a path that he's gone down that Orange Cassidy doesn't approve of. And his match with Orange Cassidy will be harder than he thought. And then John Moxley was just yelling and what he was saying were things a face should be saying, but he's very much so a heel. So... That was Collision moving over to Dynamite. It opened with the Don Callis family picking up the victory over Ricochet, Powerhouse Hobbs, Will Ospreay, and Mark Davis. They brawled before the bell. After the bell rang, this was all over the place. Very chaotic. Almost no control from the referee. There were bits and pieces where there were actual wrestling match format. But uh, Will Hobbs was taken out pretty early on. Eventually limped back out, got a hot tag spot. Before that hot tag spot, I liked that cutter from United Empire. I thought that was a pretty cool a pretty cool move. But later on, Will Ospreay hit Mark Davis with the hidden blade. Kyle Fletcher pulled him into the way of that, so that was a mistake. And then Takeshita hit Mark Davis with the knee to pick up that victory. Earlier in the match, Mark Davis countered that same knee. Kind of surprising that Ricochet was on a losing team, but in that match, Ricochet and and Hobbs were like almost nowhere to be found. Even without that injury. Like Ricochet, I feel like that was probably the worst match I've seen for Ricochet in months. Maybe years. After that, you had Adam Cole come out. He put Roderick Strong over and said that their goal is to whip MJF. Kyle O'Reilly came out and brought up how they had their second match against one another in the same area that they were in for Dynamite. And then he said that he knows Adam so well and this crusade against MJF needs to stop because now friends are getting involved and Roderick Strong wants to end MJF because of Adam Cole. And it ended with Kyle O'Reilly walking off. Later on, MJF cut a really gross promo on Roddy which Roddy responded to and said that he's not ashamed of his childhood. And he felt like he was in elementary school. He was like, great job, Max. You got me. And he said that he feels sorry for MJF. And he's going to pay for his sins. I think it'd be nice to see Roderick Strong pick up that win at full gear. Don't necessarily think that's happening. After that, you had Bobby Lashley pick up the victory over Cheeseburger and Joe Keys. Earlier, AEW showed a thing to promote Bobby Lashley taking on two opponents. And then later on, the Hurt Business pulled up and MVP had a huge big announcement that just turned out to be Bobby Lashley's going to be in action. That was already announced. And then you had Swerve clock Bobby Lashley with a chain. Later on, they found a random person wearing Swerve's coat and Shelton Benjamin attacked him. As far as this match goes... I feel like they should have just had Bobby Lashley squash Leo Rush. Like, Leo Rush really hasn't done anything super important where he needs to be built up. It would be nice if Leo Rush was in a different spot, but Swerve was barely able to get a victory over Leo Rush. So, Bobby Lashley could have had that match and boom, torn right through Leo Rush, gotten that victory... Look what I did that you could barely do. 
This match, Joe Keys ate a spear and then he passed out in the hurt lock. Prince Nana came out afterwards with a chair. Shelton Benjamin walked up to him pretty slow. And Prince Nana, if I'm not mistaken, walked off. And then Swerve appeared from under the ring. MVP was standing right there and I feel like he turned away just to like not see that. But he attacked the whole hurt business. He took all of them out. And then darted into the crowd. So that was kind of goofy. You had Claudio pick up the victory over Darby Allen. I thought this was a good match. I think it's always nice to see the strength of Claudio. I could have done without most of that outside the ring stuff though. The gut wrench powerbomb from the top rope I thought was dope from Claudio. The code red spot was brutal to watch. At what point do you just say, forget the move, don't do it? But later on, you had Claudio press Darby Allen off the commentary table onto a table by, the, I guess, the timekeeper. Didn't break. Darby basically knocked out from that. Got a blanket over him. Looked like he was sleeping. Makes it back in before the tank count. And then he got rocked with a clothesline. Very surprised to see Claudio pick up that victory. Especially with Claudio controlling most of this match, I thought Darby was going to be a Darby and and get that victory. So I'm very happy that Claudio won that. Backstage, you have the Costco guys. Big Boom AJ announced that the Rizzler will be ringing the bell <laughs> at full gear. Before that, they were in a segment with Private Party. Um... So yeah, the Rizzler is going to be at at full gear. You had Jamie Hayter interviewed. And she was asked about being cut off last week by Julia Hart. And she said she was baffled because she's never interacted with Julia Hart. And she said that if she wants to chat. And then it cuts another video airs. So I guess that's what they're going to build to. A match between the two of them. We don't know why though. Yeah, in the main event, Orange Cassidy pick up the victory over Wheeler Yuta. This feud has been so boring that I I just I couldn't have cared less about this match. The brain buster on the barricade from Wheeler Yuta I thought was nice, but most of this I just I couldn't care about. Yuta at one point pushed the referee to grab a chair. The referee didn't even care about that. He didn't care about being pushed. He didn't care about the chair in the ring. He didn't even try to stop the chair swing. And then Orange Cassidy ducked that. He gets the pin. And then he wins. And then Pack attacked Orange Cassidy afterwards. The rest of the Death Riders showed up. They duct taped Orange Cassidy's hands into his pockets. I get it. But John Moxley knocks him out. They pick him up so he can so they can push him around again. And he starts doing his gimmick kicks. And Moxley knocks him down again. Nobody comes out to help him, which he asked for no one to come out and help him. Then the conglomeration came out after the Death Riders left. They cut him loose. He stands up and he puts his glasses on. He was just knocked out. How does that make sense? How he was able to even stand and do his his kicks to John Moxley made no sense to me. I thought that was a terrible ending for a go-home show for a a pay-per-view. None of that makes me interested in Full Gear. But Full Gear taking place at the Prudential Center, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, You have the the kickoff show, Big Boom AJ taking on QT Marshall. QT Marshall released a Boom parody video this week probably one of the best things I've ever seen AEW do. So I thought that was great. I'm obviously going to say AJ picks up that victory there. I would be shocked if any other outcome happens with that. Maybe we'll see Big Justice throw a spear. Behind the referee's back, Rizzler's distracting the referee. Big Justice gets in the ring. Boom, hits QT Marshall with a spear. And then, uh, what does he call it? The power, power boom. I think he calls it a power boom. Rocks him with that. One, two, three. Maybe. We'll see. 
As far as as the main card goes, you have MJF versus Roderick Strong. Like I said before, as much as I'd like to see Roddy win, I think MJF will probably pick up that victory. Jay White versus Hangman. Not a peep from this on uh, on Dynamite. I think there was a video package. If you blinked, you missed it maybe. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Jay White's like so fallen so far down the card. I'm going to say Hangman. Fatal 4-Way for the AW World Tag Team Championships. Private Party defending the titles against the Outrunners. Kings of the Black Throne, Malachi Black and Brody King. The Acclaimed, I'm going to say Private Party retains. No other outcome makes sense to me. For the TBS Championship, Mercedes Monet defending that title against Chris Statlander. At this point, with everything going on between Mercedes and Camille... I have to assume Camille is going to be the the next TBS champion, but it's just a a terrible storyline. None of it made sense from the beginning. So Mercedes, I'm going to say, is retaining that title. You have Swerve versus Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley has to win that. Jack Perry versus Daniel Garcia for the TNT Championship. How they get to the actual match, who knows? I'm going to say... I'm going to say Daniel Garcia. Will Ospreay versus Kyle Fletcher. Who cares? Will Ospreay. Who cares? For the AW World Championship, another who cares. John Moxley versus Orange Cassidy. John Moxley retains. That's AEW. Hey, Brandon. Got any shout outs? This is Droopy Dog, and you're listening to Brandon's shout outs. The first shout out goes to Frazier, not to be confused with Nathan Fraser. Uh, the full second season, you could have laughed there. <laughs> 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 the full second season is out now on Paramount Plus. Like I said last year, I think for the most part, if you enjoyed the original show, I think you were probably someone who in- would enjoy this. I still do see those reviews where people are like, this isn't Fraser, blah, 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 blah. But I think it's literally one of the most well-written sitcoms out there Mm -hmm. because they mix, like, very well, they mix comedy and drama. And I hope it gets picked up for a third season. I hope that they can get David Hyde Pierce and Jane Leaves to reprise their roles, but I don't think they're necessary in in the show, but... At least they're mentioned from time to time. Mm-hmm. So Paramount Plus, if you're a fan of sitcoms and you watched Frasier back in the day, I would say 100% you should be watching this. And even if you didn't watch Frasier or Cheers, I, I would still recommend it. And I don't think you need to know the history of, of either show in order to to fully grasp the, the, the concept. I, I will probably not be watching it but i'm a big fan I mean, do you of have paramount plus even <laughs> i don't think so right uh who knows i mean i have disney and i don't even use it so who knows right. well but, speaking of yeah. disney plus there you go in almost christmas story and the boy and the octopus are two new shorts out on disney plus completely unrelated to one another but i think both of them they embody the spirit of the holiday season. And I thought, I think both of these are done very well as well. The first one is about a young owl that finds himself traveling through New York city, trying to get to the Rockefeller center Christmas tree, I guess to reunite with his family. And then on the way he finds a lost girl who he forms a, a, a a bond, I guess with you have Jim Gaffigan, Phil Rosenthal, Natasha Leone, John C. Riley is also in it. John C. Riley sings in it. He plays a folk singer, so I'm glad to hear another project of him singing. The other one is live action and animation. It's directed by Taika Waititi, where a boy is on vacation and an octopus attaches itself to the boy's head. And he ends up keeping it. They form a bond. And I guess he introduces the octopus to life outside of the ocean. 
I think the use of the Santa Claus, the the Mickey Mouse hat, and part of your world were done quite nicely. That's pretty cool. You could also watch that one on YouTube if you don't have Disney Plus, but I would say a hundred percent check out both of them. It's literally it's Christmas time. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what you should be watching right now. I definitely think that I, I'm always a fan of stop motion too. Uh, that's making me question: Is that first one stop motion? I don't think so. Oh, I think it's just I don't know. I think it's just I don't, I don't know. I wonder if it is. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say probably not, but it might be. All right. But I'm gonna say probably not. Yeah. But but definitely check them out. The last shout out. It's going to hot frosty. I definitely feel weird saying that. I, I saw a lot of people talking about this new movie on Netflix. So I decided to check it out. It's very much so what I picture a Hallmark movie to be like. But I thought it was funny. It stars Dustin Milligan and Lacey Chabert. And the plot pretty much sounds like an episode of Family Guy. Where Lacey Chabert's character falls in love with a snowman. (laughs) But she doesn't fall in love with an actual snowman. But it was a snowman. She brings the snowman to life. Like I said before, it's Christmas time. This is, it's Frosty the Snowman, but in human form. You have Mm -hmm. Craig Robinson and Joe Lotrulio playing cops. So it was kind of cool to see them. Not that that Craig Robinson was a cop on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but he was at some points helping the police, kind of. Mm -hmm. So it was cool to see that little connection there. Um, Katie Mixon's also in it. There's a Mean Girls reference. Where Lindsay Lohan's Netflix movie from last year or two years ago is playing on the screen. And Lacey's character was like, oh, that that reminds me of someone or it looks like someone I went to high school with. Which that's funny because in Mean Girls, they did go to high school together. But it's a nice little throwback. Yeah. So that's and that was like all over Twitter. But Mm -hmm. if you're looking for something that's super cheesy, it's a rom-com. It's holiday related. I was actually going to watch it the other day. I would say check it out. It was it was very borderline for me, but the comedy aspect definitely helped and saved it. Yeah. So I definitely I definitely uh, was about to watch it because I am a fan of that kind of uh, those movies. So. And, the, and Netflix has been like uploading a lot of Hallmark movies to the point where I thought maybe it was a Hallmark movie. Mm hmm. Because if it is actually a Hallmark movie, I'm not going to be watching it. Because those are, like, too cheesy. So Sometimes was, they could like be. Like I said, this was very borderline cheesy and everything. So just check it out, I guess. Uh, but those are my shout-outs. Now it's time for... Our... our. is right our mark out moment of the week what do you got anything for me it was definitely seeing the motorcade and the president driving by i thought that was pretty cool i thought that was pretty cool what about you i will i will mention that 2k they did an encore battle for the slim jim macho man persona card in my faction Mm -hmm. and it didn't have any card requirements. There were no match modifiers. So prior to last week, if you were doing this match and they had it there, you needed a very specific LA Knight card that you can only get by completing a, a card collection, which I'm not even close to completing. And the match for me was beyond easy, where all you had to do was complete, I think it was like 45 points out of 90 and beat AJ Styles. I was mm-hmm. done in under five minutes, which is not typical for any Persona Reward matches for me. Mm-hmm. And I think every Persona card match should be like this. 
You shouldn't have to grind to get points. You shouldn't have to spend money. You shouldn't have to have in, like win incredibly hard matches. That wolf pack pack came out and people were like, oh, this is like the easiest pack to get completed. Meanwhile, I've opened up multiple packs and I've gotten all repeats and I haven't gotten any wolf pack cards. It's a gimmick. So that's like beyond annoying. And I hope that they go the same route with that as Slim Jim Macho Man. Mm -hmm. If that's what Persona cards were able to do, like, or if that's how we were able to get them, I'd be all for that. So makes sense. Something else I uh, marked out over on Monday Night Raw, they had Miz and Karrion Cross, and Miz spoke about what they did last week to the Wyatt Six and how he deserves an Oscar for his performance. And apparently he did actually bleed. He did have a cut by his eye. Hmm. And the main gist was them saying that the Wyatts were fooled they're weak and they're not afraid of them. And later on, Bo Dallas had a video and I, I had to do the biggest double take because I legitimately thought they were using old footage of Bray Wyatt. I thought that was so crazy that Bo looked so much like Bray Wyatt there. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool too. And Bo Dallas said that they offered Miz salvation and freedom and he tried to warn Miz, and Miz damned himself. And he's sorry for what happens next. So mm-hmm. we're we're probably, I shouldn't say probably, I still really hope we get that Survivor Series match. That would be cool. I got to say, I think that uh, I'm marking out a little bit because I also forgot, but I saw Adam Pierce tweeting out stuff too today. Yeah, I don't know what he was doing. I uh, I saw all those tweets. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he's alluding to. Yeah, but there's nothing because Buddy Murphy was part of that. So yeah, you got Buddy Murphy. You got FTR. He even tweeted one out of Daniel Bryan. Yeah, so that's literally nothing. I mean, who knows? There's what happens if they all come nothing. back? There's nothing to that. They're all going to come back. Just wait. Um, On the Tonight Show this week, Jimmy Fallon was doing his doppelganger bit. And the last one that he did, a fan sent in saying that they were watching the NFL draft. And they thought that Shad Khan looked like Jimmy. And they showed the picture. You got Tony Khan right there in the neck brace. He wasn't mentioned by name. But he was used in it. They cut him out to like have Jimmy Fallon dress up as Shad Khan from the NFL draft. So I thought that was funny. I don't I I I definitely see like sometimes where Shad looks like Jimmy Fallon or vice versa, I should say. I thought that that middle that middle one, the member of the band looked just like him. I think the, the first two were like very much so spot on. Yeah, I would pick the second one. The The con one was a little bit of a stretch, though, for me. Yeah, yeah very know? much so. But yeah. I still think it was hilarious that that Tony Khan was on The Tonight Show like that. True. Very, uh, very also, true. So you had Bailey Zimmerman performing his song New to Country at the CMA Awards this week. And Big Show was there as Captain Insano on stage playing beer pong. And then he ended his performance on his shoulders. I don't understand why, why that happened at all. But it's still, I mean, it's cool to see. It's not something you'd expect. And I, I, I don't think it was mentioned on the broadcast at all that, like, oh, there's Captain Insano. Mm-hmm. There's Paul White. So I don't know what that was, but I thought that was really funny. Uh, any other mark out moments of the week? Not on my end. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. That was episode 720. You can follow us on Twitter at marking out at BTTG161 at Chris Sween Dog, CM Sweeney85 on Instagram, David PTDPT on all platforms. 
Facebook.com slash marking out, YouTube.com and Instagram are marking out 11. Pro Wrestling Tees.com slash marking out. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of sale coming up for Thanksgiving. So please enjoy your Thanksgiving. And if you'd like to support us that way, we would very much so appreciate it. You could follow us on TikTok at marking out. You could listen to us on markingout.com, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, YouTube, iHeartRadio. You can rate, review, and subscribe. We appreciate all of our, all that support. And we wish you the The best best of luck in your future endeavor. Have a fantastic week. Oh. Oh.